This video is made possible by my game bundle. Play 7 awesome games and help support the channel by using a mask and increasing the scale of so doing so and you would have this very nice depth of field is one of those effects that always looks really good. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey, a professional indie game developer and here I will react and analyze a gameplay trailer. So I will talk about how things work behind the scenes and how you could build them in your own games. The response to the previous one has been really positive, so look forward to more like this in the future and let me know any specific games you'd like to see. In this case, we're looking at the Ghost of Tsushima gameplay trailer. Alright, so let's hit play. Okay, so we start off with our character standing around, and then he opens up the map. Now, for the map itself, it's in a simplified 3D form, so the camera starts on the way back down here, and as soon as it opens, it transitions and moves towards the mouse position. Then as the player moves the cursor around the map, yep, you can see that the camera does follow. So all of this is extremely easy to do when using Cinemachine. Pretty much, you just set the camera on a fixed rotation, so upwards pointing downwards, the map is just a texture placed on a quad, and then you set the cinema machine fall position to follow the mouse cursor. So then all you do is the mouse cursor is an actual game object, and you just move that around, and cinema machine will automatically pan the camera to face it. Then you also have several methods for interacting with interactable objects. So for example, one way you could do it is to make a sphere cast around the cursor position that would locate all of the objects with colliders that are within that area, and then you would simply test to see if they are interactable. So that's one approach. Another approach, if you don't have that many objects, you could just cycle through the whole list and cycle through all of them and test all of their positions. So it depends on your performance targets and how many objects you have. Now, once there is something within range, you can also add a bit of a magnet effect to nudge the cursor on top of the icon. So you can see here as he moves, yep, there you go, it snaps into position. So in there, as the cursor approaches, once it reaches right next in there, then all of a sudden it starts being, yep, there you go, it gets attracted and goes straight on top of the position. So utilizing that magnet effect is something that is extremely useful, especially when dealing with controller. When working with a mouse you have more precision, but when working with a controller it helps to have these tiny little nudges. Then the object itself also has some information. For example, you could store this information on a scriptable object, and you would simply store a boolean to see if the location had been discovered or not. And if it had been, then you would show the proper icon. So the player sets a waypoint, and as soon as it comes out from the map, the guiding wind shows the direction. So this is a really interesting mechanic. It makes the game feel very immersive, since it looks more natural compared to having some GPS arrows like many games have. For the visual of the wind, you can use a simple particle system, constantly moving the particles in a specific direction. Now I'm guessing that the wind never actually goes through walls, so instead of pointing directly towards the target, it must be using the pathfinding system. So for example, if there was a wall in here, I'm guessing the wind would show an arrow going around the wall. Then also related to it, we have the grass particles right down here. So you can see that they also point in the same direction. Normally, this type of animation is handled through a shader. So the shader simply moves the vertices of the grass towards a certain position. So for that, you would probably have a global shader variable for the wind vector, and the grass shader would read that vector. I'm guessing that it's a global vector, rather than a specific grass tile having its own vector perfectly pointing along the pathfinding like the wind. That approach would likely be too expensive, and using a global vector works perfectly. So the vector used is probably the one right where the player is standing. Now over here the player calls for his horse, which quickly comes on running. So in order to achieve this, there are two approaches you can use. It all depends on if the horse always exists in the world or not. Now, if the horse does exist all the time, then when he uses this skill, it probably has a max range. So it knows where the horse is in the world, and it knows where the player is, and then it simply does a distance calculation to see if the horse is within range. So if so, then it finds the path toward the player. Now the other approach is if the horse does not always exist in the world. With that approach, you would always spawn the horse off screen. So the game knows that the player is over here, and knows that the camera is facing over here in this direction. So what it does is find a position near the player, but not within its radius, so right behind him, and then simply spawns a horse in that random position. So this is how many open world games handle spawning of various objects and NPCs. They get spawned near the player, but never actually in view. Oh. 
faster move. Then over here the player picks up an item. So this is just a case of a very simple sphere cast being cast around the player. So it looks for all of the objects right around the player. And if it finds something, then it tests if it can be picked up. And if so, then it shows the key prompt to use it. Then the player hits the key and in this case grabs the object. Now usually when implementing something like this, you want it to work with an interface rather than a specific object type. So in this case, the player is grabbing some bamboo, but the exact system is used for all the other interactable objects. So in this case, the player probably doesn't know that it's grabbing a specific bamboo, it just knows that it's interacting with an object. You can use an interface like I did in the how to interact with doors video. And then for the visual, you can see that the object has a slightly gradient glow. So for that, it's just a simple shader in order to make the object nice and visible from very far. Then over here, we see a detection radius. So first the UI element is pointing in the direction of the enemy. So it is calculating the camera position and then the enemy position and it tests the direction towards it. So this is very similar to what I covered in the quest pointer video. And then for the element itself, you can see that the detection increases over time. So over here it starts off and yep, it expands on both sides. So the way that it expands is simply just, first of all, making a raycast in order to make sure that the player is not occluded. And then it simply increases the float on every update. Visually, you can make it increase on both sides by using a mask and increasing the scale of the white part behind it. And then up here, yep, we see the exact same thing, but with a different sprite to indicate an animal rather than a human enemy. Now in here, the player arrives at his target and he's greeted with a nice location card. So it's just a simple collider set to trigger. There's a collider somewhere in here placed in the world. And as soon as the player enters, then it triggers the nice location card. Again, here we have another excellent example of good immersion design. So rather than placing a UI element right on top of that position, it simply spawns some particles which make sense in the world and act as a pointer for the player to go there. It's on the horizons, interesting and odd shaped trees or maybe even animals trying to get your attention. Then here we have another use of a simple collider trigger. Stay away, my lord. The spirits. So as soon as the player enters this area, it starts playing the NPC audio. Again, just a simple collider set to trigger and testing for on trigger enter. Now the player finds a fox, which is another great immersion mechanic. So somewhere around here, there's a special shrine. Then it calculates the vector pointing towards the player, and then simply chooses a random position right around the max distance. It applies some randomness so it can spawn on multiple places. So in terms of choosing the spawn position, it's very simple. Then as the player approaches, the fox starts heading towards the hidden side. And here note how the fox moves faster than the player. Then the fox is constantly checking for the distance towards the player. And if it's too far, then it simply plays a stopping animation and stays still until the player approaches it. And finally, the fox directs the player towards its hidden site. The player honors the shrine and shows this really nice UI element. So again, visually, this is very simple to do. Pretty much the same thing as the detection mechanic. So you would create a mask exactly with this shape and then behind it you would place a simple white image and on the image you can set it to fill and you can also modify the fill type to be radial. So as it increases it constantly increases alongside a circle. So just a simple mask and a rotating fill and it looks great. Then it's also very interesting as the particles flow away. So you can see that there's a sort of diagonal line running through the UI and where it interacts with things it spawns some particles. So really simple and really cool effect. Now we get onto the combat. This combat system looks really interesting. So first the player challenges the enemy to a duel. Now visually it spawns some really nice cinematic bars. So it makes the whole thing feel more cinematic. Then as he approaches the enemy, over here we see something interesting. So there's a prompt telling the player to hold down a button. So I'm guessing that the way that this works is you hold down this button and the player attacks as soon as you let go. So this whole system is probably based upon a very simple timer. If you let go before the enemy actually attacks, I'm guessing that the enemy wins and takes his hit. So you have to let him start his animation, and as soon as he does, then it starts a timer. And if you let go of the button within that timer, you're rewarded with an instant kill. So over here, as soon as he transitions into this animation, then over here a timer starts increasing, 
and the player has enough time to let go of the button and as soon as it does just testing if the hold timer is under the maximum hold. If so then there's a nice instant kill. Visually it also looks really awesome. So the player plays a very quick animation and it spawns this really nice slice visual in order to really make it very impactful. Then as soon as he takes down the first one, it seems to be the exact same thing for the second one, so the player holds down a button and has to let go right after they start their animation. So this whole system looks really, really cool. Now this is a really tricky design problem to solve. On the one hand, you want the player to feel like he's a master samurai capable of taking down enemies in a single hit, but you also need to balance it so it doesn't become overpowered. So I'm guessing that this system is only used in certain very specific scenarios, like only with the first few enemies. I'm guessing you can't just one-shot every single enemy in the game since that would be no fun. So mechanically it's a very simple system, but you combine a simple mechanic with excellent sound and visuals and you get something that looks really cool. As you can see the strike must count. Now here the player goes into some serious combat, and first of all he's under attack by an archer and also has the ability to counter. So this is one of those very simple mechanics that always feels really great. It's one of the main things that I love from my own game, Hyper Knights. Now there are two ways that you can implement deflection. One way is you can make it based on a simple button press. So as soon as the arrow is very near to the player, then you have an internal button prompt and if the player hits that button then it deflects the arrow. So similar to dueling mechanic, you have a simple time gap where you must hit that button. If you do it and it's closed then the arrow gets deflected. However, here I'm not seeing any deflect prompts coming up, so this appears to be automatic as long as the player is blocking. Again, this is all about balancing your specific design. So in this case, they probably tested with active deflection and found the player was overwhelmed by all the attacks, so they end up simplifying. Visually, you can see that the arrow is in here and has a trail right behind it. Now in Unity, this is very simple, you just use the built-in trail render. The trail render just follows an object and leaves a trail behind it. Now in here, the player does a quick dodge, so once again, just a simple timer. As soon as the enemy starts his attack, then it starts playing a dodge timer. And if the player hits it within the dodge window, then he gets a very nice special dodge. So visually, you can see a bunch of effects being added. So visually, you can see a more pronounced vignette effect on the corners. Then it also increases the bloom intensity, which you can see in the particles, and it slows the game down. So the vignette in bloom, you can do that easily by using a volume post-processing. And for the slowdown, you can do that by easily modifying time.timescale. That value works as a multiplier, which gets affected to everything that uses time.delta time. So if the player dodges right on time, yep, there you go, the player is rewarded with a very nice instant kill. Now here we see a really nice stagger mechanic. So this enemy here probably has an AI state that allows him to defend all of the player's attacks. So for the stagger, there you go, you can see a UI element increasing. And once it gets full, it shatters into a million pieces, which looks really awesome. And then there's also a really cool wave shader effect right on top. So you can see how it's a wave right around here and it pretty much just distorts everything behind it. So this is something that you can build with shader graph and a very simple texture. So the player staggers him and then in here he seems to open a charge attack. So the player holds down a button and lets go after a while and does massive damage in an arc. So for the damage you could make it really complex and make it an actual proper perfect arc. Or more likely what you would do is just do a very very simple box cast. So all the enemies within this area take some damage. Remember that game development is all about smoke and mirrors. So in this case using a simplified box cast would be much faster and much better than using something very complex which would have the perfect shape of an arc. For the player the end result is exactly the same and it simplifies your development process. Okay so that was the aggressive method and now we can move on to the stealth approach. As a general rule, it's always great to give your player multiple ways of achieving the same objective since everyone likes to play in their own unique way. So right away he starts off with a simple noise object. So the game knows where the player is looking at, so it finds this ground position. And then with that position and with the player position, all it does is simply calculate the pointer towards there and simply interpolates a very nice curve to go from the player towards the target. So in this case for example you could check the distance between the player and the target position and then you would place a point all the way up here at let's say the same distance divided by two. So doing so and you would have this very nice arc. So the player throws it and yep there you go, it simply spawns the noise object. So once again this is probably another example of a simplified system. 
So the player probably doesn't actually fire an actual physical object that goes all the way along this. What it does is it fires off the particle that follows the trajectory, and when the particle reaches its position, then it spawns the actual noise object just fixed on the floor. So doing it that way, it still looks the same, except you avoid on expensive physics calls. Then for the noise, it's pretty simple. So it knows that the object is there and simply does a sphere cast all the way around the object and locates entities that can listen around that object. So the enemy can listen, he listens to the actual listen, and when this function is called, then he knows to go and inspect that position. Then here the player sneaks behind the enemy, and this is a very simple detection cone, so the enemy is looking in that direction. So with the player being behind them, it simply tests the vector towards the player, in this case the player is right behind him, so at 180 degrees, and let's say he goes from maximum of minus 45 degrees to plus 45, so the player being at 180 is not in sight, so he's simply not detected. And if the player manages to approach the enemy without being detected, he gets rewarded with a nice instant kill. Then for this enemy here, he takes him out with a bow. So the bow mechanic is pretty simple. First of all, as soon as he picks up, you can see the UI element showing right in the middle of the screen. Then here, note how the camera zooms in. Zooming in a camera really just means switching from a wider field of view to a narrower field of view. And for example, you can do this very easily with Sin Machine. So you have your normal player camera, which has a very wide field of view. Then you have the second bow camera, which is always following the player and has a much narrower field of view. And then all you do is just increase the priority of the second camera and it smoothly interpolates all of the values. Then the enemy gets hit and it shows a very nice simple hit marker. Over here we have another nice and simple distraction noise maker. So I'm guessing that these firecrackers simply have a larger radius than the wind chimes. And now here the player has the ability to assassinate. So just a simple case of doing a sphere cast around the player and identifying all of the possible assassin targets around it. In order to have the assassinate be an option, I'm guessing that probably the player needs to be hidden from the enemy and possibly also needs to be behind it. Now here we see two possible options, assassinate and chain assassinate. So what it's probably doing is the same sphere cast to locate the first enemy. And then perhaps it does a second sphere cast around the second enemy in order to see if there's another enemy in there. And if so, then it shows the chain assassinate option. So the player takes down that one and the camera immediately pans towards the next target. So he takes down this one. And once again, it uses the same effects that we saw previously. So we got extra bloom, vignette, and a slow motion. Then while in slow motion, the camera automatically pans to look at the next enemy and shows the second prompt. So for finding the second enemy, maybe it stores a list of all the possible enemies as soon as he assassinates the first one, or maybe right after taking down this one, it does another sphere cast and locate all of the enemies within. Then this probably also has a limit, so even if you're surrounded by 10 enemies, you cannot instant kill all of them. And visually here, we also see a nice outline on the enemy. So one way of doing this outline is with a simple Fresnel effect. However, in here, it seems to be a thicker outline. So most likely, it's a shader that increases the visual size of the enemy, and simply tints it with a moving gradient glow. Now over here, the player is facing this super tough enemy, and yep, he drops a really nice smoke bomb. So as soon as he opens his inventory, yep, there you go, it shows a really nice black and white effect. I covered how to make post-processing effects in another video. So in this case, making a black and white shader, it's extremely simple. You just set the saturation node, set it all the way down to zero, and yep, there you go, everything is black and white. Then over here, it spawns some particles and makes the camera have a really shallow depth of field. So pretty much anything past the player looks really, really blurry. Depth of field is one of those effects that always looks really good. And for the action on the enemies, it's the same as always. So as soon as he fires, he looks for a sphere cast, finds all of the enemies around it, and calls some sort of stun function. Then the enemy's AI go into the stun state, and whilst in that state, if the player approaches, yep, he has the option for a critical strike. And now the player grabs a kunai and just throws it to finish him off. Then down here, he uses it to kill three enemies at once. So this is similar to the charge attack that we saw previously with the sword. So when using that same charge with a kunai, then attacks multiple enemies. So he holds down the button, and as soon as he lets go, once again, it locates all of the enemies within a range. It probably finds the three to five closest enemies, and automatically fires the kunais onto them. And again, visually, they have a very simple trail with a rotating object. So just like that, it throws, yep, just like that. So just a trail renderer and a rotating game object, and yep, looks really good. Now over here it shows a really cool mechanic, so the enemy just drops down in fear, so the game probably has some sort of global reputation score, and the higher your reputation, the more likely it is that an enemy won't be paralyzed by fear. 
This makes the player feel really powerful and grants him a nice and easy kill. Again, it's one of those design problems that need to be carefully balanced so the game doesn't become too easy. So the game probably keeps the timer of the last 5 or so enemies that fell in fear and it only allows it to happen every so often. And just in case you miss it, over here, yep, is another enemy running away in fear. So the same mechanic, except instead of falling to the ground, he just ran out of there. So some really nice variation. And the game also features a really nice grappling hook. Now in some games, the grapple can attach to almost anywhere. However, here it seems to be limited to possibly these areas. So the player is constantly looking for objects around it. And if they have the, let's say, I grapple interface, then checks for distance and if it's close enough, then it shows the UI element. And if the grapple targets are manually set, then the designers probably also set manually the target position. So they connect the grapple to an endpoint and the animation smoothly interpolates that position. Then the player reaches the object and does the action. So just a very simple timer increasing over time while the player holds the button down. Visually, again, it's a simple mask. So you have a mask with this shape and then you have the yellow part behind it constantly filling. And once it ignites, the player is rewarded with a nice victory cutscene. So there it is, mission complete. All right, so that's it. I hope you found the video interesting and useful and learned something along the way. I'm a big fan of open world games with lots of systems, so this is right up my alley. Now the response to the previous React video was really positive, so I look forward to doing more of these in the future. Let me know in the comments your suggestions for what other trailers I should react to. Check out the CodeMonkey app on Steam. Interactive tutorials, complete games and more. Click the link in the description and add it to your wishlist. This video is made possible thanks to these awesome supporters. Go to patreon.com slash unitycodemonkey to get some perks and help keep the videos free for everyone. Like the video and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more. Post any questions you have in comments and I'll see you next time.